I was in my favorite place. I was out in the forest with my six-year-old son, exploring, identifying plants and minerals, and scrambling along the river rocks, climbing through the trees, when whatever happened to catch my attention at the time made him burst out. Mommy, you're too curious. Be careful. <laughs> uh, and you might be right. Yeah, my curiosity in situations like that have led me to a couple of mishaps. But my fascination with nature also led me to become a scientist. And more lately, a scientist that works with designers. Scientists tend to look at materials from the molecule up. Designers kind of have a different approach from the top down, thinking of construction. But nature, nature looks at materials from every direction. Nature makes exactly what it needs and doesn't waste a thing. Complete recycling of matter and energy. The byproducts of one reaction are the feedstock for the next. Symbiosis. This is in stark contrast to the cradle to grave model of today's fast fashion world. Ever increasing consumption of finite resources, toxic chemicals, generation of massive amounts of waste, which have made fast fashion one of the most polluting industries in the world. By studying some of nature's best ideas, we can transform and revolutionize the way we extract, use, and dispose of materials. So, imagine a new project runway challenge defined by a new set of boundary conditions with upper limits on environmental boundaries, climate change, fresh water use, biodiversity loss, and a lower foundation of a social justice and social equity foundation, planetary boundaries that we cannot collectively exceed, and a social justice foundation that no one should do without access to water, health care, a voice. This is an inclusive and sustainable space to operate. This is our new Project Runway Challenge. By looking at nature's best ideas and adapting them for use, we can operate into this space using rapidly replenishing abundant organisms and traditional methods. We create, can create products that biodegrade at the end of their useful life, like in nature, to become nutrients for the next generation of materials. Revolution after revolution. We can close the loop on the cradle to grave with a regenerative biomimetic approach to a product's life cycle. The products themselves can come from living materials, microbes, bacteria, fungi, kelp. These may be the fabric factories of the future. Fed just sugar and tea, a symbiotic colony of yeast and bacteria, what we know as kombucha culture, spin cellulosic fibers. The exylum bacteria present is the only thing outside of plants that can make cellulose. Most things need a cell wall to make cellulose, but not this bacteria. With simple, it's a simple organism that has an amazing function. It can grow cellulosic fibers that will grow and grow, and the filaments will merge into a thick mat that raises to the top of the container, which then can be taken out and dried to create a fabric that's paper-like or leather-like. The material has inherent challenges, inhibiting direct translation to textiles. Suzanne Lee was the first designer to explore use of this material in fashion design. And during her fantastic TED Talk, Grow Your Own Clothes, she laughed that this jacket that she was wearing on stage uh, was swelling up with water <laughs> and falling apart on her. And although that might be an exciting performance piece, it was not exactly functional textile. So some of the big challenges are water resistance, strength, flexibility. So a team of uh, students at FIT and faculty advisors teamed up to address, use natural methods to address some of these inherent material challenges. We weren't ready to let go of this ultimate cradle to cradle material. It's like a snake eating its tail, it just keeps regenerating. So we set out to grow a pair of baby shoes. <laughs> we sought out natural techniques to improve the water resistance, strength, flexibility of the material. 
We tried a lot of things. Um, we used plant oils and waxes to try to make it waterproof, trying to mimic the, bi the hydrophobicity of a lotus leaf. We thought we could make it stronger by embedding it with husk uh, pineapple fibers, only to have the material promptly snap in half. <laughs> so after a series of trial and errors, we decided to look to indigenous techniques. Indigenous processes, like those of nature itself, have been practiced and perfected over millennia. Native American practices of uh, tanning and smoking produced exceptionally soft hides that stay pliable even after being exposed to water. But would this work on microbial leather, which is in fact not leather at all, it's actually cellulose? <laughs> um, well, there's only one way to find out, and if you're curious, that's what you do. Um, so would it work? Well, it did. The ancient techniques gave the material three times stronger both strength and flexibility over the as grown material. That was pretty exciting. More than that, it made the material water resistant and close to waterproof. It improved the strength and flexibility and much, much, much to our surprise, it imbued the material with extreme flame retardants. This is a 2,000 degree torch. The material does not ignite. The flame will not propagate down the fabric. This is really something. A microbial cellulose that does not ignite. Flame retardants are, chemicals from flame retardants are found in almost every American family with um, concentrations much higher in children, and they're linked to a myriad of health problems birth defects, reproductive issues, cognition issues, neurological problems, autoimmune diseases, and possibly even cancer. So the idea that we could use bacteria, tea, and sugar, and native techniques, and grow a fabric that didn't catch on fire was very, very exciting to us. Then we were really surprised. So what do you do? If it doesn't catch on fire, you, you keep hitting it with fire, right? That's what a curious person does. So we, just, uh, we took that 2,000 degree torch and we held it onto the material. The flame would not propagate, but we burnt it to an ash. Within an hour, the material returned to its original form. In my years as a material scientist, I've never seen anything like this. This opens up a wide range of applications. And now I think about those fibers growing in the lab upstairs. What will they grow up to be? <laughs> Breakaway firefighters clothes? Non-toxic carpet backing? Display modules for trade shows that are biodegradable and non-toxic? The little guys have so much potential. <laughs> Mycelium is another living material that can be grown to shape. It's the vegetative husk of fungi. Um, you might recognize it as that spidery white network that goes across a tomato that kind of has a cut and starts to go bad, or some old coffee grinds. Well, it's eating it. it it's a vegetative part of a mushroom, and it has this fantastic ability to break down complex cellulosic organisms. Well, that's great for us, because we, we wound up feeding it woodshop waste and corn stalks, and grew a pair of baby shoes exactly to shape, which we then stitched together with pineapple top fibers, husked from discarded pineapple tops, which we foraged from the local smoothie shop down on Broadway, <laughs> and then colored with pigment from our compost, including avocado seeds, as well as indigo leaves fermented to a dye bath. And at the end of eight weeks, the students succeeded in growing a completely biodegradable, non-toxic, flame-retardant baby show. Your kid could eat this moccasin <laughs> or, or plant it and decompose it to grow another pair the next size up. <laughs> to reinforce and emphasize the closed-loop nature of this shoe, we embedded carrot seeds in the material before drying and embossing it. The, the shoe could be composted or planted, 
and at the end of the summer, your little one could have a carrot to chomp on, could chop the top right off and use that pigment to dye the next generation of materials. So we set out what we wanted to do, and we grew a pair. <laughs> The idea is to rethink textiles within a circular economy, explaining nature's processes perfected over 3.8 billion years since the formation of the first bacteria and utilizing indigenous knowledge and tradition to create materials that operate within that safe space for sustainable and just living. These materials use no synthetic chemicals, no petrochemicals. Simple, minimal materials generate little waste. They can be accessed by anyone in the world. Nature has provided us with a handbook accessible to students here at FIT, to indigenous artisans and in coastal communities around the world. Picture these artisans weaving kelp-based yarn dyed with local, natural, traditional pigment in their traditional culture from a kelp forest buffering a vulnerable coastal community from the effects of climate change? Well, we did, actually. At AlgaeNet over the last year, we've been exploring biopolymers extracted from kelp. We've created a dimensional film and a knit textile. Well, why kelp, right? I mean, why bacteria, why, why kelp? Kelp is one of the most rapidly replenishing, fastest growing organisms in the world. It can grow up to two feet per day. That makes it a huge source sink for carbon dioxide emissions. It also is, has an amazing ability to absorb agricultural runoff from factory farm fertilizer as well as municipal waste, turning that waste right into biomass. It can uh, rehabilitate damaged fishing communities and um, increase the biodiversity, marine biodiversity, in areas suffering from coral bleaching, ocean acidification, and the effects of climate change. Kelp has a number of nutrients which make it a valuable food and fertilizer, and now, as you'll see, a biomaterial that can operate in a closed loop life cycle. So we start with seaweed. <laughs> we extract a biopolymer called alginate in a powder form, which we can then turn into a hydrogel. And using a variety of different methods, we can cast it into a thick film or extrude it into a fiber. Here's a little clip of our extrusion process. Oops. Sorry. Patience. <laughs> So the, the paste is extruded into a curing bath where chemicals cross-link the polymer chains into these long fibers suitable for a textile. The only byproduct is sodium chloride, ordinary table salt. From there, we put it on a winder so it can dehydrate and strengthen the material, and then we can use it as a bio yarn. It has materials prop that has properties similar to a monofilament fiber. We've been exploring with dyes from natural pigment and like the other biomaterials, mycelium and microbial cellulose, natural pigment from cochineal, marigold, your compost readily bind to the alginate-based gels and fibers. And what's very exciting about this is that we can incorporate the color directly into the paste before extrusion or casting of the films, eliminating the water use and emissions of dip dyeing practices. Well, it wasn't always like this. <laughs> Our first iterations of the bio yarn um, kind of turned into something like a dried ramen noodle, basically overnight. <laughs> but we've been working with our friends at Columbia University Engineering, iterating chemical modification, modifying our recipe, and doing mechanical testing so that we can improve the elasticity um, enough that this can now be knit on an industrial knitting machine as well as the strength, so we can see it evolve to a fully functional, versatile textile fiber. This is our first zero waste hand knit to shape tank top. I'm wearing it now for the first time on the TED stage. <laughs> Thank you.
It feels great. It makes me want to go swimming. <laughs> Um, it's knit to shape, eliminating, eliminating waste in the production phase. Um, and at the end of its useful life, well, it'll put nutrients in the soil to grow into the next generation. As with our bio, film, bio yarns, we had some trouble with our bio <laughs> films in the beginning. They were really prone to shrinking and distortion. But again, by working with um, chemical engineering and mechanical engineering and applying a fascination with nature, a team of science and design. We were able to iterate uh, formulations, and now we have a film that we can reliably cast and mold into different shapes. Um, this is really exciting. Beyond clothing and apparel, we can think of this as an alternative material for bioplastics. So instead of petrochemical-based plastics and th synthetic fibers, we can have a kelp-based fiber that's just fully compostable and uses minimal waste. So uh, what's next for us? Well, we can further improve the properties by modifying the form factor. We have hacked some 3D printers that can 3D print kelp, again, having zero waste in that production phase. And we look forward to re realizing our prototype for a pair of algae kicks, a performance-based sneaker with a machine knit upper, and a 3D printed kelp-based sole. Each of these materials have inherent challenges that need to be overcome. And in the spirit of stitching together nature-based solutions to some of these global problems, Algae Knit and Grow a Pair teamed up to produce the waterproof flame retardant sneakers that I'm wearing right now. They have a coconut husk and kelp-based insole, a microbial leather upper that's been tanned and treated. They're completely waterproof. The material is strong enough to endure an industrial uh, sewing machine. And unfortunately, they don't let you take a 2,000 degree torch on stage <laughs> because it would be pretty fun to walk through fire right now. <laughs> These are the minds, the hearts, and the hands behind this work. We're curious as to what you see in nature. Striking color from a geometric layering of feathers on a bird. The blueprints for a carbon sequestering bioconcrete in the shell of a mollusk. I mean, really, the possibilities are endless. And the only limit is our imagination. So please, stay curious. Thank you. <laughs>